I'm Mike Gilliam. Interactive museums, flying kites, the Rubik's Cube, and a special aquarium. It's all ahead as we find out what you can learn about science while having some summer fun. Science in You starts now. I'm Carol Ann Riddell, putting the fun in science by taking the lessons out of the classroom. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. A family trip to the museum over the summer can become a very pricey proposition, but we found a technology lab where the exhibits are hands-on, but it's hands off your wallet. We're visiting the Sony Wonder Lab. That's coming up next on Science and You. Hey, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We are at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey, where the Rubik's Cube is celebrating its big 4-0. That's right, the cube is 40 years old. Coming up on Science in You, I'll show you how this little cube has contributed to music, art, and science. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Want to know when and how your child can actually touch exhibits at the American Museum of Natural History? Stick around to find out, coming up on Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz, the physics of kite flying, ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. We're talking summer fun, and do I have something special to show you? A chance to meet my little friend here. We'll tell you where, ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Here's a fun way to learn about repeating patterns. We're at the Long Island Children's Museum, where teachers are bringing science lessons to life by taking them out of the classroom. Take a look. The Long Island Children's Museum is closed to the public on Mondays between September and June. But it's not closed to these second graders. They're part of a partnership between the museum and the Westbury School District that opens both the exhibitions here and the minds of junior scientists. We tagged along on a recent visit and saw the program in action. The goal, to get and keep children interested in STEM topics, science, technology, engineering, and math. It's really about access and getting kids engaged early. Early learning is really important. We want kids to be engaged in science, technology, engineering, and math. We have to get them to understand it and to really spark their curiosity at a really young age. Amy Terzuli is the director of education at the museum. As she explains it, the galleries here become learning laboratories for the students, an extension of the classroom outside of the classroom. It's all about applied learning and giving them direct experiences that they really can take away and say, aha, we want them to have those aha moments here at the museum. We also work alongside the teachers and getting them curious. We told them, throw out your textbooks. We don't want any textbooks in this program. We want you to learn how to grow a seed and actually grow it, not just read about it in a book. Pretty cool pattern, right? Yeah. It makes brown, red, brown, red. Children learn about pattern, symmetry, and motion by doing, whether that's spinning a top or turning a wheel. You can make anything a pattern, and patterns are all around your world. In this mapping class, the students tackle geography and units of measurement, creating a map of their own to help their teacher find a treasure chest hidden in the room. Great job, boys. This helps to close the education gap. For some of these children, this is their only opportunity to visit a museum. The communication center helps kids understand how the science behind technology evolves at lightning speed. Many of them have never seen a relic like this before, a phone with a dial and a cord. Hello? Hello? It's much more hands-on here than it can be in the classroom. It gives them much more uh, freedom to move about and to explore their physical space. Why push STEM topics? Take a look at these numbers. According to the National Science Foundation, for 2011, only 35% of eighth graders performed at or above what's considered proficient for their grade in math. That number was 32% in science. We need innovation. We need um, curious thinkers. We need children who are thinking um, outside the box. And I so where to begin? Perhaps by harnessing what already comes naturally to children, enthusiasm and the thirst to know more. What do you think of science? 
I think it's re really cool. The program is now in its fifth year and recently expanded to include first graders as well as second graders. It will continue next year bringing more young scientists into the museum. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. If you enjoy technology, then the Sony Wonder Lab should be on your summer to-do list. Even though the target audience is kids ages 8 to 14, we've found children of all ages having a good time. And best of all, admission is free. Located on Madison Avenue in Midtown, the Sony Wonder Tech Lab is a place where kids can learn about the past, present, and future of technology. Once inside, you're immediately immersed in technology as you're asked to sign into the lab using an ID card. It stores your picture and allows you to sign in at each exhibit you visit. They have to first feel a connection in order to want to learn more and to understand. So the key is really to kind of lure them in with something that they might experience in their everyday lives or find interesting um, and then kind of go from there. Corrine Duran is the senior program manager at the Sony Wonder Tech Lab and gave us a tour of the museum. At the nanotechnology exhibit, Small is put into perspective using the earth and a green pea as an analogy. She would be a billion times. That's a thousand million times smaller than she really is. So she would be one nanometer tall. She'd be a billion times smaller than in real life if she were standing on an earth the size of a green pea. Next, kids try their hand at open heart surgery. It's one of the more popular lab exhibits where even the steadiest hands are put to the test. We basically uh, take them step by step through the process. Um, and what we wanted to show them is a uh, technology called haptics. Um, which is what surgeons use when they're training in surgery and it allows them to feel the sensation of what it is to cut into a, a body and to perform surgery without using an actual body. Our goal is really to show kids real world applications of technology so it was important for us to really give them a sense of how this is used out there in the real world and, and in careers and um, you know and surgeons have to learn as well they have to train just like everyone else. From virtual surgery to virtual broadcasting kids get a chance to channel their inner news anchor as they stop by the Sony Wonder Lab studio. We really wanted it to be very lifelike and very much uh, simulated to a real broadcast studio. We brought in real t uh, studio lights um, we simulated the blue screen, we have real studio cameras here, and we even put in back of house. So we have a director role, we have a sound engineer, we have a technical director as well, because we wanted kids to understand that there are many different um, things that come into play in creating a TV broadcast. A fun way to kill some time while waiting for your turn at the Wonder Lab studio is the interactive light floor. So we wanted something that um, kind of kept the kids busy while they were waiting to do certain exhibits, um, but also brought in our theme of how technology helps kids, helps people rather, uh, connect and create. Along with the light up floor, kids can use motion capture to make animations dance. After stepping inside the control capsule, the computer automatically recognizes the user and their movements. I think, you know, um, kids and adults together um, are very fascinated by robots. Which is why the museum included these drivable robots as another featured exhibit. The robots are controlled by the kids and show their picture from their ID cards. The flashing lights on the robots appear to be a big hit. So basically the goal of the exhibit is to turn lights on on the floor of the zone. Um, once all the lights are turned on, there's actually like a little light show. Um, and the robots are equipped with RFID tags underneath them. A little deeper into the museum, light and music come together with Grammy Award winner Alicia Keys as different tracks from her song New York light up and travel across this interactive LCD table. You can change up the mix by adding or removing different instruments, adding your own touch to a top pop hit at a top summer spot in New York City. Even though admission is free to the Sony Wonder Tech Lab, tickets are still required. You can find more information online at sonywondertechlab.com. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. Hey, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. We're at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Rubik's Cube. This little cube has inspired all this and much more. 
How many hours have you spent doing this, twisting and turning the Rubik's Cube? Well, you're not alone. Based on estimates of toys sold, one out of every seven people in the world has played with the Rubik's Cube, some more successful than others. This year, Rubik's Cube turned 40, a perfect reason to devote an interactive exhibit beyond Rubik's Cube at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City. So at Liberty Science Center, we wanted to not just celebrate the 40th anniversary, which is cool. It's the world's best selling puzzle. It's sold at least a billion, but it's inspired people in so many fields. Indeed, in the Cube's 40 years on this planet, it has inspired music, arts, games, and of course, science. Here's the prototype of it, the original one made from wood, rubber bands, and paper so he's Paul Hoffman, the center's director and the man behind the exhibit, is a big fan of the puzzle and its inventor, Erno Rubik of Hungary. He was in his 20s and he, at that time he had just gone in a PhD in design and he was teaching his first undergraduate course of kids that wanted to be architects or designers and he was frustrated by what he perceived as their inability to picture three-dimensional objects in their mind's eye. He thought, how are these people going to be architects if you show them a simple blueprint, a two-dimensional drawing, and they can't see the object. So he invented Rubik's Cube as a pedagogical aid to improve his students' sense of three-dimensional geometry. The original cube, which is on display here, was called the Magic Cube. The name later changed to Rubik's Cube when the toy was produced and sold to the mass market in the United States. It was the must-have toy in the early 80s. I mean, it did. It sold 160 million in one year. The top three books on the New York Times bestseller list were books on how to sell a Rubik's Cube. A guy invented, it was basically a hammer, a Rubik's Cube smasher to smash it in frustration. He sold millions of them. I mean, it really was phenomenal. Sales dropped off in the mid 80s, but thanks to speed cubing competitions and robotic science, the Rubik's Cube made a comeback. Speed cubing competitions are held all over the world, including this recent one at the Liberty Science Center. It's all about mathematical algorithms and fast hands. The current record is 5.55 seconds. Bump. Amazing, right? Especially when you hear how many times the cube can be moved. How many twists and turns can right. a Rubik's Cube make? Okay, so it's make. 43 times 18 zeros after it, okay? An unfathomably large number, 43 quintillion. And each of those positions can be unscrambled to this position in at most 20 twists, okay? But nobody knows what those 20 moves are. Only the mathematical god in the sky does. These speed cubers that do it, humans, that do it in 5.5 seconds, that's the world record, and robots that now can do it in three and a third second, they do it in 50 to 70 moves, okay? 50 to 70 in only 3.3 seconds. And yet there's a 20 move solution that at the moment is beyond computing power and it's beyond human ingenuity. So the cubers have something to aspire to. Even the resident robot at the exhibit likes to practice. This Denso VS650 industrial robot is one of the more popular sites here, mesmerizing young and old. Yeah, the robot's really fun. This is a robot that, it's an industrial strength robot that normally paints cars on an assembly line. And my team took that same robot and programmed it to do Rubik's Cube. And it does a victory dance when it solves it. And uh, I don't think it wants to go back on the assembly line because it doesn't get to do a victory dance after it paints a car. I think the next one just keeps on coming. Show off. But in all seriousness, the Cube has contributed to robotic science. When Rubik's Cube first came to the West, there were quickly human speed cubing competitions who can solve it the fastest, but then computer scientists wanted to build robots. And it was not a trivial task back then in 1980 because robots weren't good at vision. So the first thing you have to be able to do to try to solve it is know where the colors are. So they had to make advances in computer vision to solve Rubik's Cube. And then the last thing robots got good at was the fine motor skills necessary to actually m manipulate the cube. So it's uh, led to advances in, in robotics. The cube also inspired art. You'll find artwork made entirely with the cube, or you can help make one. The exhibit includes an interactive section where museum goers can help create the Statue of Liberty. 
The Cube has also inspired jewelers. Check out this 18 karat, $2.5 million version of a Rubik's Cube. And yes, this one can also be moved more than 43 quintillion times. Aspect of it that I love is that it was one man's ingenuity that came up with that mechanism. And the Rubik's Cube could have been invented 50 years earlier. It didn't depend on some scientific or technological advance. So I think it's amazing in our highly technical age that someone can come up with something just by their creativity and ingenuity and touch one in seven people on the planet. I think that's great and that's inspiring. Have you solved the cube? Well, I'm going to go and break the 5.5 uh, seconds when I do <laughs> You're it. You're training so right I'm now, I'm training, right? exactly. Okay, Beyond Rubik's Cube will be on exhibit here at the Liberty Science Center through November, and then it's off on a world tour for the next seven years. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science & You. I'm Tina Beth Pina. The American Museum of Natural History has launched a program that introduces kids to a wide variety of scientific disciplines through hands-on investigations and interactive tours of museum exhibits. It was fun. Uh, I did a space one. It's cool learning about like scientific stuff. These kids are excited by the museum's new program called Adventures in Science. Science is so important because it's really about, you know, understanding your surroundings, becoming science literate, being able to know what's going on in the world as you grow up. So our purpose here, we design these courses, these workshops, these camps, in, to engage these kids, get them science interested, allow them to investigate a little further into these topics, and hopefully become lifelong learners of science. Year-round, the museum offers kids from pre-K to 8th grade a variety of workshops exploring all different aspects of science, including one called Unlocking the Mystery of Poisons for both parents and kids. We learned about poisonous frogs, snakes, mm -hmm. venomous, and, and toxins and poisonous. I like how like, animals can camouflage, and I like like how, the, how tortoises, like different animals, have different like special things. In this program, they're really allowed to ask questions. In class, they're, they have to get through a lot of stuff, and there are so many more kids. But in this class, they're really they're encouraged, and they have the time to ask as many questions as humanly possible. And that's what we want them to do, to ask questions, come up with their own questions. And that's really, we give them data, we give them observations, we give them dioramas and stories and things to look at. And then from that first observation, they can generate their own questions and then hopefully even come up with their own answers. It's so cool because you get to learn a lot of stuff and then you get to know that for the rest of your life. And you can be like the smartest person ever. Children also get guided tours of the museum's exhibits and get to see and sometimes touch collections that the general public doesn't have access to. What you can't touch normally in the exhibits, you still can't touch but you do get the inside knowledge about it. And then we do take our students in behind the scenes into the laboratories and the collections, and that's where they can touch these things. What are some of the exhibits that are involved in the program here at the museum? So we use all of our exhibits. It really depends on what the topic of the camp is. So for instance, our Poisons in Nature workshop that we are going to see today, they go into the Power of Poison exhibit. We have um, paleontology camps, and they go into all of our dinosaur halls. It's an amazing resource to have the museum at our disposal. We can have scientists come in for some classes. Last week we had a live snake come in, and they were able to hold the live snake. We have so many collections, real anthropological collections. And those are resources you can't get anywhere other there's no application process for elementary school camps, grades 1 through 5, and registration is on a first-come, first-served basis. For Science & You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Every kite climbing into the sky is a sublime feat of simple physics. We turn to some kite flying experts to give us the lowdown on how a kite gets into the sky. A kite flies for the same reason an airplane flies. A kite flies when the forces that lift overcome the forces of gravity. The downward force of gravity is also known as weight. A flying kite is a successful battle of, of lift over gravity. And these forces of physics that lift a child-sized kite are the same forces that lift a much larger, grown-up kite. 
We're here at the New York Kite Center where kite flying is taken to the extreme. Owner John Pereira explains to us how these same basic principles of physics apply even when the kite is flying the kid. At the end of this bar, there's a giant kite. When I push the bar away, I get less lift. And when I push the bar in, I get more lift. And that's because, just like pulling on the string of your little kite will make it dip or soar, changing the angle of your giant kite alters the amount of wind it can hold. More wind, more lift. Less wind, less lift. Yeah, so the forces of lift are not the only forces in play here. We also have a lot of pull generated from the kite. So as I dive the kite into position, it's going to pull me downwind in that direction. It's much like sailing. If you notice, a sailboat will go across the wind back and forth and actually has the ability to go upwind as well. Those forces in play are the same as kiteboarding. So this board here is something that is pretty common for kiteboarding and it allows you to, again, push on the water in a certain way that's going to allow you to glide across the water. The lift of the kite reduces the forces of gravity, which actually allows you to stand on the water. Kiteboarders use science in all kinds of interesting ways. Anybody who's playing on the water is concerned about the weather, but how do you predict the wind? This time of the year, we get a lot of thermal winds. That's created because the temperature of the land is much warmer than the temperature of the water. So as the air rises off the land, it draws in air from the ocean, creating a sea breeze or thermal winds. And by keeping a close eye on changing temperatures, kiteboarders can get a pretty good idea of how strong that breeze will be, which is very important because a lesser breeze needs a bigger kite to win the battle against gravity. Kiteboarding may look extreme, but the New York Kite Center teaches kids and parents and grandparents, and there's no better place to learn than our Great South Bay. Turns out geography is very important in kiteboarding, and New York's large, flat expanse of waist-deep water with wind from multiple directions is the perfect combination. From Amityville, Long Island, this has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. This is the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, Connecticut. It's a very special place, a great place to both learn and also have some good summertime fun. Now, Dave Sigworth here is gonna serve as our guide today and show us around here and show us some of the neat things that you can see if you just come up here for a visit. Dave, let's start with this right here. What do you have? So this is a huge map of Long Island Sound. So we're a little bit different than most aquariums because almost 90% of our exhibits are about Long Island Sound. There's no Nile tank here or Amazon tank here. We want our visitors to understand about the environment and the animals of, of Long Island Sound. So we're, we start you off with this huge map that lets you sort of orient yourself to where you are. A lot of people like to look to see where they live. Jeez, and then I see the striper in there. The striper's here. So, so what we're trying to do is that we have a little kiosks here and we're going to ask you some questions about some of the animals and in the environment of Long Island Sound at these kiosks. The answers will show up on the big map. And that actually starts you thinking about what you're going to see when you go through the aquarium galleries. The aquarium sits steps away from the mouth of the Norwalk River and the Sound. It's home to a lot of touchy-feely exhibits like this area. This is our shark and ray touch pool, so you can actually touch a live shark or ray, and you can do it and come back with all 10 of your fingers intact. So we've got some nurse sharks and some smaller species of sharks down here, as well as several species of rays. And it's really cool to go home and say that you touched a shark today. Oh, Dave, now this is something I usually don't like to see when I'm out in the sound. <laughs> Jellyfish. Right, now, now we call them jellies because they're not fish. And same we're trying, we try and teach people about starfish, our sea stars, because they're not fish either. So these are moon jellies. So you may have seen jellyfish that are sort of red. Those are lion's mane. You don't want to touch those. But these are moon jellyfish, and if you use two fingers, just like at the Ray Touch Bowl, you can touch the tops of their bodies. They do have tentacles, but they're very benign to us. I mean, if you were a little piece of, a, like a shrimp or something, this would hurt, it hurt you. But they don't, they don't really hurt us. And so, um, but you have to be very careful. You have to know what kind of jellyfish or jelly you're talking about, sort of like mushrooms. I won't tell you what they feel like. You have to go and see for yourself. They also have the other things you look for at an aquarium, including the huge shark tanks and, so they do a little recycling. The seals, complete with a feeding schedule. Okay, now I've saved the best for last. This is the Laura Keats exhibit here. It's only here this summer, what, through Labor Day? Through Labor Day, yep. Okay. Yep. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting experience to have all these birds come around you. If you have one of these little cups of nectar, well, they love it, and they'll land on your head and your arm. Your oh, Dave, let's go see the Keats. <laughs> let's go see come these on. things, come on. 
But these are lorikeets. They're native to the South Pacific. I think there's about 55 of them in here of 11 different species. Uh -huh. um, you know, just really beautiful coloration. Okay, so you have one that's already landed on your hand right? here. And they'll do this for the nectar, right? They love the nectar. They have an adaptation that their tongue sort of expands as they sort of put their tongue in there. So it's more of like a, you know, just a very quick uh, dabbing. They'll land on you, they'll walk up and down your arm, they'll land on your head, your shoulder. And you um, say you have about 55 of them? 55 of them, 11 different species. Big time summer fun. If you plan on visiting the Maritime Aquarium, it's a good idea to check out their website. There you can find the price of admission and also the hours of operation. And you can also see some great deals from Metro North Railroad. Remember, it only takes about an hour to get to Norwalk from Grand Central. That's our show. I'm Mike Gilliam, and we'll see you next time on Science and You.